Welcome back to How to Read the Bible. Last time we introduced this course, we looked at why we need interpretation, some of the challenges we face when approaching the Bible, and how history has revealed over and over again why methodology matters and why it is so important. We presented two foundational methods we'll be using and learning and applying in this course and in future courses, biblical theology, inside which we find covenant theology, and exegesis. We looked at how the Bible proposes its own language or method to read it in, namely narrative, and how the Bible is one unified overarching story. In today's class, we will be looking at the Bible as a historical document, the history of this book. How did we get it? The Bible that sits on your bookshelf didn't just show up one day, an express delivery sent from heaven, ready bound, signed by the author. The King James Version didn't just sprout out of the ground one morning. So how did we get this book? And how did it come to be in the form or forms we find it in today? That is our topic for today, the history of the biblical document. We're going to go deep into world history and scholastic history, but I promise amid all those dates and details, it will be worth it when we come out the other end. And it will help us to understand quite a few things about this book and help to clarify its origins. So hang in there, it's all leading somewhere important. Let's first begin with the elementary question, what is the book of the Bible made up of? Firstly, if we are referring to the Christian Bible, it is made up of two parts, called the Old Testament and the New Testament. Secondly, the Bible is divided into smaller books, the Protestant Bible is comprised of 66 books in all, 39 in the Old Testament, and 27 in the New. There is a standard way of ordering these books, which one appears first in the Bible, second, third, and so on. But because there are different methods of how to arrange them, and because some of the timelines within the individual books overlap, the order of the books we find in most of our Bibles isn't necessarily representative of a perfect historical chronological order. An example of this is the book of Job, one of the 66 books we find inside the Bible. Job is considered one of the oldest historical events in the biblical timeline, yet this book is placed in the middle of the Old Testament's order of books. We will come back later to look at why this is the case, but this is just for now to demonstrate that books aren't always in chronological order of events. So, we have this book called the Bible, and inside of it are all these smaller books. How did we get all of these smaller books? Well, like we said, the Christian Bible as we know it didn't just show up fully formed and compiled one day. It didn't exist like this, 66 books inside one larger book. Each of these 66 books were at one time, more or less, 66 individual documents, or scrolls. So Esther was one scroll, Psalm was one scroll, and so on. Scrolls were an ancient form of physical document. Instead of a book with pages you can turn, a scroll would be a one-line piece of papyrus, a type of paper, or animal skin that you would roll up similar to an architect's drawings. The first part of the Christian Bible, the First Testament, called the Old Testament, is actually taken directly from Jewish scriptures, or the Hebrew Bible. So all the books from Genesis to Malachi. The Hebrew Bible is a collection of scrolls written and assembled over a 1,000-year period by the Israelites, the majority of which is written in Hebrew. The Israelites had a short name or an abbreviation for their scriptures. It was called the Tanakh. And here's why. They divided the scriptures into three different categories or three sections. Law, 
in Hebrew, Torah, also meaning instruction or teaching. Prophets in Hebrew, Nevi'im, meaning literally spokespersons. And writings, Ketuvim, hence Tanakh. The Israelites' approach to categorizing the various books differs in part from how we likely would in a Western approach. For example, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings is categorized in the Tanakh as being in the prophets group. In contrast, Western scholars use a historical critical approach when grouping these books. And of course, the way you approach changes the way that you read a biblical book. The existence of the Tanakh with its three categories is referred to by Jesus himself in Luke 24, 44, when he said, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The law, the prophets and the Psalms. Psalms, which falls into the third category of Ketuvim, or other writings. So the canon existed by the time of Jesus, and likely well before. The synagogue Jesus attended as a child and adult would have had copies of the scrolls of scriptures. These were read from each Shabbat. I mentioned earlier that I would touch on why our Bibles today don't order all the books according to historical chronological order. The answer is that we adopted much of the Jewish categorization of books falling into these three categories, at least as far as order goes. So Job, although one of the oldest historical events in the Bible, isn't near the beginning of a modern Christian Bible because Hebrew scriptures categorize the book as being part of the Ketuvim group, the other writings, also called the poetic books. That's why if you open up your English Bible, you'll find Job placed alongside Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, other poetic books. But back to the canon. Hebrew tradition states that it was Ezra who fixed and gathered the canon after the exile and return from Babylon. So the Old Testament canon seems to have existed before New Testament times. Now we've used the word canon a few times. Let's make sure we know what that means before moving forward. Canon is taken from the Greek word kanon, meaning literally rod. This refers to what the ancients would call a measuring rod, or what we today might call a ruler. A canon is a measuring rod or standard against which all others are judged. So the biblical canon is a canon, the standard against which other documents are measured. There are many other books and documents from similar time periods. But the 66 books which we find in the Protestant Christian Bible are referred to as canon or the canonical books. These are those that the ancient Jewish scholars in the assembling of the Old Testament and in more recent times, biblical scholars and historians have agreed can be satisfactorily verified as genuine, reliable documents. The process of determining this is through historical accuracy cross-referencing with other reliable sources and texts, and the historical legitimacy of the author, and so on. We're going to today see how there has been much debate at various points in history about what documents should be included in canonical scripture. This is not a modern debate. In the Jewish rabbinical schools, they debated books like Esther, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon. The book of Esther, for example, contains no mention of God. Some said, how can we then include this book in canonical scripture if it makes no mention of God? Also, the main characters seem to have no problem with violence. The book of Ecclesiastes, all that talk of everything under the sun is vanity. It is deeply pessimistic. And the Jewish rabbinical schools also debated Songs of Solomon, a document which is pervasively erotic. 
asking what's the point of including this when it's filled with eroticism, but God is only mentioned once. The point here is to highlight the existence of debate. If you want to go really deep into the scholastic history and process of how books were canonized, you can refer to the resources in our reading list. But for now, when we say canon in this course, we are referring to the 66 canonical books of the Christian Protestant Bible, unless otherwise stated. Now, there is a separate group of texts called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha are writings or statements of doubtful authorship or authenticity. In Christianity, the word apocryphal was simply first applied to writings which were not considered canonical scripture. But in the wake of the European Protestant Reformation, the word apocrypha also came to mean false, spurious, bad, or heretical. In short, the apocryphal texts have doubtful authenticity in comparison with the canon. If we might sum up, the Christian belief is that the biblical canon has a closed connection, meaning it is absolute and complete. Secondly, it is authoritative. And thirdly, it is divinely inspired. In short, the canon is a collection of closed, authoritative, divinely inspired books. So we've touched on the Jewish Bible and how it was made up of three groups. It was written in Hebrew and is called the Tanakh. The first significant translation of the Tanakh or the Old Testament was done into Greek. This translation is called the Septuagint, estimated to have been written the 3rd through the 1st century BC. The Septuagint was written specifically in Koine Greek. Koine Greek differed from the ancient Greek or classical Greek in that it was a simpler form, written and spoken by everyday people, and based on a more recent dialect. Koine simply means common in Greek. The Septuagint is sometimes referred to as the Greek Old Testament or the translation of the Seventy, and the Septuagint is often abbreviated in scholastic reference as LXX. Now, why is that? Well, following the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC, Four of his generals, Antigonus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, divided his vast empire into four parts, as we can see here on the map. His Macedonian Greek general, Ptolemy, established the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt. His son, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, inherited his position and became the pharaoh of the Ptolemaic Egypt, from 284 BC to 246 BC. During Ptolemy II's reign, the material and the literary magnificence of the Alexandrian court was at its height. He was an eager patron of scholarship, promoting the Museum and Library of Alexandria, seeking to add to it new texts and grow its collection. The Greek translation of the Tanakh derives its name Septuagint, or translation of the Seventy, from the story that Ptolemy II requested that the Law of the Jews be translated into Greek, and that this be done by 72 Hebrew translators. Although some details of this story are likely not historically accurate, biblical scholars do agree that the first five books of the Hebrew Bible were translated from Biblical Hebrew into Koine Greek by Jews living in the Ptolemaic Kingdom, probably in the early or middle part of the 3rd century BC. The remaining books were presumably translated in the 2nd century BC. Now, few people could speak and even fewer could read the Hebrew language during the Second Temple period, so the period after the Jewish exiles returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. Koine Greek and Aramaic were the most widely spoken languages at that time among the Jewish community, and so the Septuagint satisfied a practical need among them, thus the translation. As for the abbreviation LXX, 
Septuagint comes from the Latin term Septuaginta, derived from the Latin phrase Vitus Testamentum ex versione Septuaginta interpretum, the Old Testament from the version of the seventy translators. The Roman numeral for seventy is LXX. And so now we know that when we see LXX written in modern scholarly works and even in the margins of ancient scrolls, that it is a shorthand for the Septuagint. LXX refers to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And the Septuagint was the translation widely used among followers of Jesus. It still existed during and beyond his time. A little later on, we're going to see why the Septuagint was so key in affirming the legitimacy and the fidelity of the Bible. Another translation which existed of the Old Testament was called the Targum. The Targum was translated from Hebrew, not into Greek, but into Aramaic. As we mentioned, many exiles lost knowledge of Hebrew while in Babylon and picked up Aramaic instead. Thus, the translation was made for their use and benefit. Now, a major question about the Old Testament, and indeed the New Testament too, concerns the matter of accuracy. Because simply put, physical scrolls cannot usually survive thousands of years. Physically cannot survive. Whether that scroll is made of papyrus or animal skin, physical matter, especially those made from biological matters, don't last forever. They crumble, they rot, they fade, the fibers break down, they are subject to moisture and insects. And that's not even beginning to consider events such as fire, war, deliberate destruction, population displacement, human forgetfulness and misplacement. We even find such a story within the Bible itself, demonstrating how easily documents can in fact be lost. In the story of King Josiah, the Book of the Law or the Pentateuch, what we now know as the first five books of the Bible, were locked or hidden away because the current kings served other gods and were unfavorable to Israel's God. It only took a couple of generations for their hiding place to be forgotten. And within Josiah's lifetime, a scroll was then rediscovered, meaning that within a short period, they were also lost at one point. All this to say, we don't have the original physical scroll that Amos actually wrote on. We don't have the original scroll that Ezekiel put pen to. And so how could the Israelites continue to have their scriptures hundreds or thousands of years after the original scrolls were penned? Well, through copying, through duplication, by making copied versions of the original. Now, of course, they didn't have printing presses back then, so replicas had to be written by hand. This work of copying was considered a sacred and highly important task by the Israelites. Jewish scribes were carefully and meticulously trained, often in rabbinical schools, in how to hand copy manuscripts. The aim, of course, was to change nothing, but to make a faithful copy of the original. But, as logic would dictate, as the years roll on, you're no longer copying from the original manuscript, are you? You're making a copy of a copy, and then a copy of a copy of a copy. Thus the question of accuracy arises, and the problem of human error. Do we end up with a game of telephone, where by the time the message is whispered to the seventh person, the message is completely jumbled and changed? How can we trust that the copies we ended up with, these copies of copies made over hundreds of years and passing through hundreds of hands, is an accurate reflection of the original? Well, let's get into it. 
there are numerous ways we can and have restored the context and confidence in the Bible. Scholars do so in different ways, using various approaches and methods, some of which we will now be looking at. One method is to compare the Jewish Pentateuch with the Samaritan Pentateuch. If you know a bit about biblical history, you'll know that in 930 BC, the Kingdom of Israel split into two. The Kingdom of Israel to the north and the Kingdom of Judah to the south. Eventually, the northern Kingdom of Israel was invaded and captured by the Assyrians in 721 BC. The ten tribes in the northern kingdom were thus taken into captivity and scattered. They intermingled and married with other surrounding nations. The southern kingdom of Judah would later, in 600 BC, be taken captive to Babylon. These exiles don't return to Judah for 70 years. Now, later in the New Testament, this group of people called the Samaritans are mentioned in the story. They live near the Jewish people in the region called Samaria, but they are not a part of them. The Samaritans were believed to be the descendants of the exiled northern kingdom. They share many of the same beliefs as the Jews, but the Jews see Samaritans as being illegitimate, saying, you mixed with other people, you differ in your beliefs from us, you are no longer true or pure Israelites. The Jews looked on the Samaritans with loathing and with clear ethnic and racial prejudice. Now, the Samaritans had their own scriptures. They, too, had the Pentateuch. It had survived among them despite their captivity in Assyria. And a way to check the accuracy of the Jewish Pentateuch at the time of Jesus would be to lay it alongside the Samaritan Pentateuch and see if they match. Because once it came from the same original document, but was of course copied by different people. And if the two match, even after the kingdom split, people were dispersed, language changed, these two groups didn't interact or see each other for many years, for generations, how could they? One group was in Assyria, one was in Babylon. They have used different scribes to make their copies. They hadn't collaborated with each other. So if their copies are satisfactorily similar, it is a clear affirmation of the legitimacy of the most recent copies, because these two peoples did not compare or associate. In fact, the animosity between them actually serves the purpose of proving the text's fidelity. What scholars found was that comparing the Jewish Pentateuch and the Samaritan Pentateuch did indeed prove the soundness of the copies. And differences were easily identifiable, and one could see why the changes were likely made. Some 6,000 differences were found between the two, which may initially sound like a lot, but most of these were minor variations, such as the spelling of words or grammatical constructions. And this is to be expected when we consider each of these languages and dialects changing over time and differing from each other. The most significant semantic changes were, as we said, easily identifiable, and we can see why they were made. For example, the Samaritans couldn't really believe that Jerusalem was the center of spiritual significance or identity to their people as it was to the Jews. Why? Because Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom of Judah. It was the capital city of Judah. Samaritans were not allowed into the Jerusalem temple, not welcome in Judah. Thus, they had no access to the priests there or the sacrificial system to forgive sins based in the temple, or the future which was promised to the Jews centered around that city. And so the Samaritans moved the epicenter of their faith instead to a mountain in their territory, called Mount Gerizim. In their Pentateuch, a change was made stating that God commanded the people 
to raise an altar to him on this mountain in Samaria instead of in Jerusalem. You can see how this plays out in the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. He speaks to her about what she believes. She believes that Mount Gerizim is the most holy place for her people, and that this, and not the Jerusalem temple, is the epicenter of where they are to worship God. And so, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, the copies made these changes, including a commandment to build an altar on Mount Gerizim. And it's easy to trace back the reason as to why this change was made. Now, before we consider other ways to confirm the fidelity of texts, let's take a closer look at more of the specific challenges surrounding the copying of original manuscripts. The simple truth is that the Bible's copying comes with errors and certain corruptions. We must simply accept that in the copying of the original manuscripts, there were mistakes made, and as in the Samaritan Pentateuch, there were intentional changes made too. An example of intentional change can be found in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you shall not die. Only in some manuscripts it says, we shall not die. This is because Jewish scribes made the decision to change you to we when Habakkuk refers to God and death. Reverence for the nature of God as an eternal God may have been one of the reasons for this change, since the mention of God dying, even when the intent was to deny it, was offensive to some of the scribes. Another reason for the change may have been that in the mind of the scribes, just to say that God does not die might raise doubts in the minds of the reader that it might not be true. Most likely, the reason for the emendation is that the scribes found the original words disrespectful to God. Even though the scribes had a high respect for preserving the text, their reverence for God seemed to have trumped their reverence for the text. So here we have an example of intentional man-made changes being made. Another challenge in reading and copying original manuscripts can only be understood if, one, we understand what the original or oldest versions of the scrolls looked like, and two, when we understand how the scribes copied manuscripts and what their work environment was like. Let's have a look at that now. To begin with, what did the oldest scrolls look like? Firstly, Ancient scrolls were often written on animal skin. Although materials such as papyrus and stone existed, if you wanted a scroll to last as long as possible, and perhaps to be portable, you would choose animal skin. This kind of scroll was extra expensive, but again lasted longer. And in the days of Jeremiah, they seemed to be writing with pens made from reeds and ink, as is mentioned in Jeremiah 36, 18. Now, because animal skin scrolls were expensive, you would want to cram in as much as possible into a small space. You didn't have the luxury of hundreds upon hundreds of pages to tell a story. In fact, many biblical books were originally written on a single sheet, a single scroll. And so you're not going to waste that space. The most ancient manuscripts were written without spacing. No spacing between words. It's just one long stream of letters. Try to imagine how it would feel reading such a text. Here, for example, we have the first few verses of Genesis chapter 36. Now, let's try to read that without spaces between the words. And there were no capital letters and lowercase letters. So it's a long stream of capital letters with no spaces between. Then, 
on top of that, there is limited or no punctuation. And as if that wasn't challenging enough already, the oldest Hebrew writing used only consonants, no vowels. Although vowels were used in spoken language, obviously, they were not written that way. So Genesis 36 ends up looking like this. Here, of course, we are using English letters and not Hebrew, but it's to demonstrate the point. Now, additionally, there are certain letters which look or sound very similar in Hebrew, such as the anglicized D and R, and H and the guttural H. On top of that, remember in those times they had no eyesight tests, and scribes often remained scribes for their entire lives. Likely some of their eyesights diminished as they entered into their 90s. So the oldest manuscripts would look like this, if we can demonstrate in English. First, no spaces, and then, no vowels. If you were a scribe going to read this, G-D-S-N-W-H-R, how would you interpret it? How would you write it down in your copy? Good snow higher, good sun wear, God's nowhere, or God's now here. You can see the challenge. And to add to all of this, let's now have a look at the environment in which many scribes were working. As mentioned, scribes often belonged to rabbinical schools or a hub of scribes, a place they could all live and work together. And it was in this environment that duplicates were made in an activity we call large copying. Not because the text was particularly large, but because the duplication was a group activity. In a room, which would come to be called scriptoriums in the Middle Ages, there would be sat a group of scribes, each at their own desk, each with their own pen and paper, and then the dictation of the text they're meant to transcribe for that day would be read aloud by the head scribe. So he would be at the front reading out loud the text, and then they would each copy it down as they heard it. This naturally has its pitfalls. Do people in the back hear what he's saying as well as people in the front? What if someone is hard of hearing? What if the person next to you coughs and you miss a word? What if someone mishears? As in English, Hebrew has similar sounds for different things. In English, we have air and air. Is it the air of God or is it the air of God? In English, save three and four pence, we're going to dance, sounds awfully similar to send reinforcements, we're going to advance. Human errors were made. We have examples of these. The first typical kind of error we find is called metathesis. Metathesis is when you're writing and accidentally reverse letters in a word, the reversal of the order of consonants, for example, from and form. An example of metathesis can be found in Psalms 49.11. Most of you will have a footnote attached to this verse in your English Bibles, noting that this is a possible mistake in the text, an accidental reversal of letters in a word. Another example of common errors is called dictography. Dictography is when you mistakenly write a word twice. The brown dog jumped over the the fence. Then we have marginal notes. Sometimes scribes wrote notes in the margins, comments, on the text. These marginal notes were not always distinct from the text itself. 1 Samuel 18 demonstrates this in early manuscripts, where it isn't clear if something is the scribe's commentary notes or it is part of the original text. Now, similar to the mistaken repetition of a word, we have something called haplography where a scribe fails to repeat a letter or a word, or repeats a letter accidentally, such as dessert versus desert. 
Also, the message of the Book of Job might become the massage of the Book of Job. A likely haplography occurred in some manuscripts in Judges 20.13, for example. Then we have something which is called homoioteleuton, a Greek word meaning similar ending. This is where, when reading, you might read the same word or line again, thus transcribing the repetition. Now, when we step back and consider these errors, these imperfections of scribal work, we might come away feeling an amount of trepidation. How can we trust the copies we have today? If one scribe was distracted by a bird flying by the window, will he miss a sentence read out by the head scribe and thus change the entire story of Moses? If a bumblebee lands on one of the pages, will the man transcribing mistake it for a letter and alter the course of history? Will an accidental smudge disprove the legitimacy of Isaiah's messianic prophecy? The answer is, no, it won't. The discrepancies or errors are not catastrophic and often detectable. Many of the typical mistakes we've identified here led to minor changes and don't dramatically change the meaning of the text. And again, these can often be identified by comparing manuscripts to each other. We mentioned earlier the comparing of the Jewish Pentateuch with the Samaritan Pentateuch. Similarly, confidence in the Bible has been restored in other ways too. Let's now have a look at a couple of other significant ways that confidence in the Bible has been restored. Firstly, in the meticulous and almost obsessive work of the Masoretes. The name Masorete comes from the Hebrew word Mazodeth, meaning tradition. The Masoretes were tradition keepers. These were the groups of Jewish scribes who dedicated their lives to scrupulously copying and transcribing the scriptures. They functioned between 500 AD and 1000 AD. Living in collectives, these scribes worked all their lives at copying and preserving texts. We call their transcribed work the Masoretic Text. Among other things, the Masoretes created the written vowel system for the Hebrew Bible. As you may recall, the earliest Hebrew script did not have written vowels, only consonants. The Masoretes devised the vowel notation system for Hebrew that is still widely used today. Here we can see Genesis 1-1 in the English Standard Version. Then we see a picture of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is ancient Hebrew from the first century BC. Now here we have the Masoretic copies of this verse. This Masoretic text is from 1008 AD to 1009 AD. Notice these little marks around the Hebrew letters, which I've highlighted here in yellow. These are not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls above it. These smaller marks and symbols are the vowel system that the Masoretes came up with. And as we can see here, they are still used in modern Hebrew today. Secondly, the group compiled a system of pronunciation and grammatical guides in the form of diacritical notes. Diacritical refers to those marks or signs we have over letters to indicate their pronunciation. For example, in French, we might call these diacritics an accent. If you use a smartphone, you have probably seen these options while typing a text message. Thirdly, the Masoretes created a system of symbols used for cantillation. Cantillation is the manner of chanting readings from the Bible out loud. Similar to cantillation in music, the Masoretes symbols indicated further about how to pronounce the text and where to put emphasis, or as my professor used to say, emphasis. Fourthly, the Masoretes also created paragraph and verse divisions. These were not just scribes fanatical about the quality of their copying. 
they considered every consonant sacred. This is demonstrated, for example, in that if a single wrong letter was found, the entire document was destroyed. The old scrolls, which were being replaced because new copies had been made, were given a literal burial. Suffice to say, the quality control of the Masoretic work was of the highest degree, so much so that even when they saw mistakes made by previous scribes or monks, they only footnoted the error, not changing the manuscript by making a correction, but faithfully copying it. The quality control was made easier precisely because of the way they structured the text, by, for example, dividing it into verses. They would count the number of words, the number of letters, and the number of verses in each book, making sure that nothing was left out. They then determined what the middle of the book was, what word and letter was at the middle, and used that middle word as a reference to check that all copies matched, that all duplicates had the same word at their middle. A brilliant quality check system. The Masoretic work enjoyed an absolute monopoly for 600 years, and experts have been astonished at the faithfulness of the earliest printed versions, late 15th century, compared to the earliest surviving codices, late 9th century. The Masoretic text is universally accepted as the authentic Hebrew Bible, which leads us to something called the Leningrad Codex. The Leningrad Codex is a handwritten book bound on one side as opposed to a scroll. It is the oldest complete manuscript of the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew using the Masoretic text. So using this system of verse divisions and vowels and cantillation. According to the statement in the book itself, it was made in Cairo during 1008 or 1009 AD. The Leningrad Codex is so named because it has been housed at the National Library of Russia in St. Petersburg since 1863. Now, another and perhaps one of the most significant events to have restored confidence in the Bible in modern times is the extraordinary discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. One day in 1948, a young Palestinian Bedouin boy called Muhammad Adib is watching over his flocks in Qumran. Qumran, we can see here, is near the northwestern shores of the Dead Sea in Palestine. And Muhammad is part of the Palestinian Ta'amra tribe, the remnants of which still live in and around Bethlehem today. It's November, and Muhammad is out with his flock, together with his cousin Juma Muhammad and Khalil Musa. Muhammad is trying to retrieve a runaway animal, and using his slingshot, slings a stone into a nearby cave in which he suspects the goat has gone into. But when he throws a stone into a particular cave, the sound of the impact is different. He hears the sound of crockery breaking. Muhammad goes to take a closer look and actually ends up falling into one of the caves in this raised rock face. And inside he finds clay pots that contain scrolls with writing on them. Muhammad retrieves a handful of scrolls and takes them back to his camp to show his family. He keeps the scrolls hanging on a tent pole while he and his family contemplate what they should do with them periodically showing the scrolls to other interested Palestinian Bedouins. He's just brought back the scroll of Isaiah, and an ancient commentary of the book of Habakkuk, among other things. First, Muhammad takes the scrolls to a dealer in Bethlehem, Ibrahim Ija. And Isha states that they are worthless and warns Muhammad that they might be stolen from a synagogue and Muhammad might get into trouble. However, undaunted, Muhammad Eddib continues to search for answers. 
He goes to a nearby marketplace where a Syrian Christian takes a look at them and offers to buy them. Now, at this point, an Arab sheikh overhears the conversation and suggests that the scrolls be taken to Khalil Eskander Shaheen, a cobbler and part-time antiques dealer. Several of the scrolls are sold to Shaheen for no more than around 367 US dollars as of the currency rates in 2022. Later that same year, the scrolls catch the attention of John C. Trevor, a young intern archaeologist of the American Schools of Oriental Research, who compared the script in the scrolls to that of the oldest biblical manuscripts then known. This leads to Trevor tracking down Muhammad and asking the Palestinian Bedouins to take him back to where they had found the first scrolls. What follows is the discovery of 2,000-year-old scrolls stored inside pottery within several caves. Most of the scrolls were written in Hebrew with a smaller number in Greek and Aramaic. It now becomes clear these are biblical scrolls, ancient versions of them, older versions by far than was known to exist. More archaeologists from the West returned to Qumran and, with the help of the Palestinian Bedouins, discover more scrolls in 11 surrounding caves between 1949 and 1956. Scrolls like Isaiah, Genesis, Psalms, Judges, Daniel. However, the process of getting to the area, finding more scrolls and preserving them, is delayed and made difficult because of the increasing Zionist aggression and terror. Then, in 1948, the Nakba happened. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine and the near total destruction of Palestinian society at the hand of Zionist forces. The State of Israel is illegally established, and in less than six months, from December 1947 to mid May 1948, Zionist armed groups expel more than 750,000 indigenous Palestinians from 220 villages. Because of the violence, the atrocities and displacement, the Dead Sea Scrolls are moved to Beirut and Lebanon for safekeeping. On the 11th of April 1948, Miller Burrows, head of the ASOR, announces the discovery of the first scrolls in a general press release in the U.S. Of course, the truth of the discovery being made by Palestinian Bedouins is minimized or not mentioned in most Western historical accounts. And although we might all know the name of the first man who walked on the moon, most of us don't know the name of those boys who made this historical, groundbreaking discovery. Nor are the circumstances of their people's genocide or displacement surrounding the discovery talked about. Here, therefore, is the picture of the Palestinians who discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Once they grew up, Muhammad Adib to the left, his cousin Juma Muhammad to the right, and his friend Khalil Musa. And here is Khalil Eskander Shaheen, or called Kando, the cobbler who first saw value in the scrolls and bought some off Muhammad and his friends. Now the question became, where did the ancient scrolls found hidden in these desert caves of Qumran come from? Well, the answer lies with a group called the Essenes. The Essenes were a group of sectarian Jews. They left the center of Jerusalem and took all their scrolls with them into the Judean desert to live there. They left because they believed that their fellow Jews in Jerusalem had lost their way, that the priests serving in the temple were corrupted by Roman influence, and specifically the appointment of high priests had become a politically fueled game as opposed to a sacred God-appointed role, and they weren't wrong there. Josephus writes that the Essenes, or the Essenoi, numbered around 4,000 and lived in various settlements throughout Judea. 
He lists them as one of the three sects of Jewish philosophy, alongside the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These scrolls, discovered many years later by a Bedouin boy in the Judean desert in 1947, are considered to be a part of the Essenes library. It was not uncommon to store scrolls in this way, in pottery inside caves where moisture and sun wouldn't get at them. The Essenes existed between the 2nd century BC and the 1st century AD, so before, during, and after Jesus' time. However, in 66 AD, there was a Jewish revolt. Many Jews took up arms against the Romans. This is called the First Jewish-Roman War. According to the conventional view, the Essenes disappeared during this time, and the settlement in Qumran was destroyed, presumably a retaliation from the Romans. But left behind were these hidden scrolls, forgotten by history until they were discovered one day by a shepherd boy shortly following World War II. Upon close archaeological examination, the authenticity of the Dead Sea Scrolls was confirmed through radiocarbon dating, comparing of scribal styles, and other books from the Essenes Library proving they were genuinely as old as was hoped. Now, why was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls such a huge deal? Well, firstly, if you recall, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, had been around for a while. Now, what you could now do is compare the Septuagint in Koine Greek to the older Hebrew text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You could affirm that the Septuagint had been true in its translation. You could identify and understand specific translation choices that were made. For example, why the ancient Jewish translators picked one word over another. This also meant you could get insight into ancient Jewish theology and method. In fact, we looked at this in our Covenant Theology course. How in Hebrew... There is a specific word for covenant, but in Greek, there are two. So which to pick when translating? We looked at how the translators picked the word diatheke instead of syntheke to describe the covenants God makes with human beings, because syntheke refers to an agreement hammered out by two equal partners, while diatheke refer to one party acting independently, such as when a person gives another person a free gift in their last will and testament. We can now see the theological understanding of the translators based on their translation choices. Thirdly, the Dead Sea Scrolls were significant because of their age. Because now you can take those more recently made copies of copies of copies, such as the LXX or the Septuagint or the Leningrad Codex, and lay it alongside the Dead Sea Scrolls and compare them. And what they revealed was that the level of accuracy was remarkable. The Dead Sea Scrolls were proof that manual scribes had done an even more accurate job in copying the text by hand than some of the electronic copies made in modern times. Again, because of language and other factors, small differences could be seen. For example, Isaiah 21.8. Some manuscripts use the word for allowed, while others had copied a lion instead, probably owing to a similarity in the sound. But not a single difference shook the meaning of the text or cast doubt on the fidelity of the original. In fact, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls hugely bolstered confidence in the biblical text. And it remains one of the most important and impactful archaeological finds in the study of the Bible and in the greater world. 
We're now going to take a look at how the early believers, the early Christian church, related to scriptures. How did they relate to the Old Testament? And how were the newer writings, such as the four Gospels and the writings of the Apostles, considered and eventually compiled into a canon called the New Testament? So, let us begin with the setting of the early church. Following the ascension of Jesus, the disciples return to Jerusalem. The story about Jesus, the Messiah, is shared to Jews and Gentiles alike, beginning in Judah and spreading out into the greater Roman Empire and beyond. Communities of believers were formed, made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Letters and reports were written that would later become what we know as the books of the New Testament. The four gospel books, known to us as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, are collected reports and accounts of Jesus' life, where he came, what he did, written down so that others could hear about this person too. As Jewish believing communities are formed, otherwise called churches, the disciples who knew Jesus and the apostles who are leaders of the church write letters to these communities. These letters contain news, statements of belief, theological teaching, prophecy, instructions for how the community is to treat one another. Now, just like in the assembling of the Old Testament canon, the New Testament canon didn't just come ready bound and good to go. There were many debates over the years about what should be included in it, about the historical accuracy and theological reliability of the texts and their authors. Additionally, there would be shifts in politics and allegiances that affected how some influential church leaders and thinkers thought about these different documents, whether it was the Gospel of John or one of the letters of Paul. One such social influence had to do with Jews versus Gentiles. The question of how does Judaism relate to Christianity? So much of the church did not want to be seen as a branch of Judaism. They wanted to send the message loud and clear, we are a new thing. It's not just for Jews. We're not a Jewish sect. It's for anyone who believes Jesus is who he said he is. A way that many of the early church segments ended up distancing themselves from the Jews was by denouncing certain religious practices considered quintessentially Jewish. For example, they rejected fasting. Or if fasting was to be done, it should be done on different days than the Old Testament Jewish festivals called for. And Shabbat was also included in this exclusion. Many said, no, these are Jewish things, we will not adopt them. Naturally, this created a distancing for some from huge chunks of the Old Testament, or the Old Testament entirely, because the Old Testament is, after all, steeped in the context and the history of an Israelite or Jewish people. This anti-Jewish sentiment led to the favoring of a document called the Didache. Didache is Greek and it means teaching. The Didache may be considered one of the earliest forms of a summary of Christian doctrine. It contained a summary of key points of the Christian faith. It talks about Christian ethics, rituals such as baptism, communion, the Lord's Prayer, and certain liturgical guidance. As we've alluded to, a larger question in the first centuries AD was which books are authoritative for Christian believers? Which ones do we use to measure other things against? The question of canon. What should be included in the canon? Instances of this back and forth discussion can be seen, for example, in the writings of Marcion of Sinope. Marcion was a first century Christian theologian from today's northern Turkey. He declared that Christianity was in complete discontinuity with Judaism and entirely opposed to the scriptures of Judaism. Another influence came from Justin Martyr, 
born around 100 AD in Shechem, in Samaria, Palestine, otherwise known as today's city of Nablus. He was a Christian philosopher and apologist, and his view was that the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were valuable. He wrote well about the four Gospels, stating that they should be included in the Church's scriptures or authoritative writings. Just for some clarity, the time period we refer to as early Christianity spanned from 1 AD to 325 AD. During this time period of early Christianity, there was no universally accepted New Testament, merely books considered of greater or lesser value. There is something called the Muratorian Canon for this time period. It's a copy of perhaps the oldest known list of most of the books of the New Testament. While likely not intended strictly as a canon list, the fragment is evidence of among the first attempts to systematize such a group of approved writings, and is assumed to originate in the second century. The Muratorian canon contained a list of about 170 works, books considered important for public worship and reading. But as the general discussion for a New Testament canon continued, two principles emerged as being important in the selection of books, or qualifying factors. The principle of apostolicity, so the book can be traced back to one of the disciples, apostles referring to one of the twelve original disciples of Jesus, and this includes Paul, and the second factor considered was the content of the book, inner consistency, context, was it in agreement with the rest of Scripture. In the year 325 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine, who had converted to Christianity, invites 1,800 bishops of the Christian Church within the Roman Empire to come together. This gathering would be called the First Council of Nicaea, held in the ancient Greek city by the same name, situated in today's Turkey. There were a lot of differing views floating around in various churches about theology and understanding what the faith was. The purpose of the council was to attempt discussion and some conclusions about these matters, to move towards a unity on issues. It was historically significant as the first effort to attain consensus in the Church through an assembly representing Christianity in the Roman Empire. One of the matters discussed at this and following councils was the New Testament canon. What should be included, what shouldn't? Members of the churches in the eastern part of the Roman Empire were still discussing the canonicity of Revelation, for example. Over time, these church leaders debated and presented for and against various documents and books. Many works with Gnostic influences were rejected as absurd or impure writings. It was a long, slow process, but the first proof of some conclusion about a canon shows up first in 367, when Athanasius of Alexandria, a Christian theologian, writes in a letter that he accepts the 27 books as canon, which we today know as the New Testament. This canon of 27 is officially accepted at the Synod of Hippo, another council held in today's Algeria in Africa. They release an official letter of acceptance. This was then reaffirmed by the Council of Carthage in 397. Ultimately, most Christian councils officially indicate their acceptance of the new canon after the end of the 4th century. If we need remind ourselves, a biblical canon is defined as a collection of closed, authoritative, divinely inspired books. Although some debate continued, many saw that agreeing on a canon was a way of dealing with the problems and heresies within and without the church. Heresies that included everything from Jesus not being seen as fully God, that the Trinity was not made up of three literal and individual persons, and so on. Yet, similar debates that existed in the early centuries of the church 
do continue to this day. For example, in theological differences between Catholic and Protestant theology, the Eastern Orthodox faith and the Roman Catholic, and so on. Theological divisions lead to the splitting of the East and Western European Church, when in 1054 we have what is called the East-West Schism, the separation of Western and Eastern Christianity. In the end, we end up with the Roman Catholic Church in the West and the Eastern Orthodox faiths in the East. Let's now jump forward a bit in time, into the Middle Ages the 14th and 1500s, when the events of the European Protestant Reformation takes place in Western Europe. Up till this time, there was generally only considered to be one universal church in Western Europe, namely the Roman Catholic Church. Its epicenter, its authority and power lying in Rome. But several theologians and thinkers began to question and study the teachings and practices of Rome, questioning or challenging its theology. Perhaps most well known of these voices of dissension is that of Martin Luther. In the days of Luther, the Bible was not open or available to lay people. To anyone who wished to examine or read the text, this unavailability is most glaringly demonstrated in two ways. Number one, the Bible was almost all written in Latin, the language of Rome. Secondly, Bibles were rare and only accessible to clergy. You might have one Bible in your church or cathedral, but this book would literally be chained up often to the pulpit, locked up in churches to prevent theft, also lending a poignant visual of what was practically happening, the Bible being in chains, so to speak. Scripture not being accessible to most people. Many couldn't read, scriptures wasn't in their language, and books themselves were rare and expensive. Thus, any access to the biblical text had to come through your clergyman. It was sifted through, filtered through, your priest or your bishop. In what he shared at Sunday Mass, in his sermons, in the theological interpretations of Rome. There was no checking the text to see for yourself if your local priest's interpretation is accurate or true, or if it is being manipulated or twisted in order to maintain power or oppress masses or to be in the Pope's favor. This was a huge point which Luther advocated for, the accessibility of the Bible for any believers. He took steps to make this happen by translating the New Testament from Latin and Greek into German. And he and other reformers made use of a brand new invention of their time, namely the printing press. This meant that books and printed texts could be made more affordable and could be mass-produced. Instead of one hand-copied Bible in an entire town, Bibles and theological books could be circulated more widely. The Reformation brought a massive shift in the relationship people could have to the Bible. But, well worth noting here, Luther held some deeply anti-Semitic views, views which increased over the years. Luther denounced Judaism, calling for harsh persecution of its followers. This stoked a hatred for Jews in many German and Protestant areas, associating Jews with the rejection and murder of the Messiah. For one, these anti-Jewish ideas would survive in what would later be established as the Lutheran Church or Lutheranism and other parts of Protestantism. Luther's rhetoric contributed significantly to the anti-Semitism in Germany and beyond, and the prevailing views of historians is that it provided an ideal foundation for the Nazi Party's attack on Jews in the 1930s and 40s, an attack that would hide behind the reformers' opinions, mix it together with a seemingly Bible-backed understanding, and masquerade hatred as faith fervor. 
A part of Luther's anti-Jewish outlook also meant that he perpetuated a similar distancing from anything he considered overtly Jewish in the Bible, like was done in the first centuries of the Church. That would mean that certain parts of the Old Testament would be ignored or less focused on, that the Jewishness present in the Gospel story, the Jewishness of Jesus, of the historical events in the Bible, would be downplayed. You can see how this slanting view might affect not only Luther's teachings, but things like the theological perspectives he left behind in Protestant thinking, the biblical interpretation of texts, and yes, the choices made when translating the Bible into German and later into other languages spoken in Europe. Now, you may be wondering, why are we bringing this up? Why are we pausing to mention Luther's anti-Semitic views and their legacy in a course where we're learning about how to read and interpret the Bible? We're bringing it up because it's so important to understand that the history surrounding the translation, the interpretation, the accessibility and the printing of this book called the Bible was not born in a vacuum. The translation and interpretation of the Bible has always been affected by the politics of the time, by the language and culture of the time, by world events and personal bias and prejudice. If we don't understand this, we will miss that some Bible translations are heavily coloured by these things, that some translations are deeply rooted in anti-Semitism and misogyny, Puritanism, racism, a Western European white supremacist royalist agenda. We mentioned Luther's views because it sets the scene for what we'll be looking at moving forward. Which brings us to the final topic of today's class, namely the history of Bible versions. The entire Bible has been translated into over 700 languages. The New Testament by itself has been translated into 1,500 languages, making the Bible the most translated literary work in human history. Additionally, as you may know, within English alone, there are many versions of the Bible. When we say versions, we mean different translations. Suffice to say, the choice for which translation or which version to use can be a bit overwhelming. A bit daunting. There are over a hundred English complete translations. Where do you begin? How do you make your choice? Are some versions better than others? How can we end up with different translations if we're translating from the same Greek and Hebrew text? In this final section of today's class, we will be looking at some of the main differences between Bible translations as well as briefly looking at the history of how some of these versions came to be made in the first place. Because, as we'll discover, the historical and cultural circumstances in which these Bible translations were created can have a huge effect on the translation work itself. Today, we will only be looking at English Bible versions. Before we begin, we need to clarify something about the nature of translation. The trickiness and complexity of translation can sometimes only be grasped, as we said in our first class, by people who are bilingual or multilingual. If you speak more than one language, it is likely that you have experienced how translation is not always a straightforward thing. It's not pure conversion. It's not always as simple as this word in this language equals this word in that language. Why? Because of the complexity of both language and meaning. You'll know the hilarious translations you can end up with if you've ever used Google Translate before. Because a machine, though it may know all the technical words of a language, doesn't always grasp the meaning and struggles with things like idioms and so on. And so you can end up with comical translations like this safety warning sign translated from Spanish into English. In case of volcanic eruption, you will hear mermaids. 
do not ignore the mermaids. They are there for your safety. Now, in English, this sign will have you scratching your head. How could we have ended up with this rather funny-sounding sentence? Well, because in Spanish, the word for siren is serena. But serena is also the word for mermaid in Spanish. So if you make a literal translation into English, you suddenly are talking about hearing mermaids instead of sirens. Another example is this sign, intended to say stay off the grass, reads do not disturb, tiny grass is dreaming. In fact, if you take a moment to examine some of the literal meaning of words in your own language, you start to notice how strange some of those words are. I've personally had this experience. My husband is British. I speak both English and Norwegian. And sometimes he'll ask me what a Scandinavian word or phrase means. And I'll notice how difficult it can be to translate certain things because there's no direct parallel English word or because the literal meaning in Norwegian is quite strange. Such is the word ektiskop. Literally, it means real cupboard, but in English, the correct translation would be marriage. In Danish, you might call a loved one skat, which means both treasure and taxes, and the phrase ufta, which is an exclamation expressing everything from dismay, surprise, astonishment, empathy, exhaustion, and relief. In English, it would be spoken as oops then, which doesn't really convey the meaning. Consider how in English we have one word that means several things, like the word bat. It is this winged creature, it is a baseball bat, or it is the verb to bat something. The point here, the emphasis of the challenge is conveying the original meaning. In order to translate in a way that conveys meaning, we also need a second ingredient, namely interpretation. So to translate a text, we need translation plus interpretation. And you may already foresee the challenges here, because where there is room for interpretation, there is room for the variables of personal perception, judgment, bias, prejudices, assumption, cultural baggage blind spots, worldview, and so on. It is significant to understand that no Bible translation is infallible or perfect. No interpretation should be above scrutiny or a second look. Because language, interpretation, and most importantly, people are not perfect. This is one of the reasons why we're going through so much history today. To get a sense of how historical events and settings affect translators, it allows us to identify some of the presuppositions, the political agendas, the cultures of those doing the translating at various and specific points in history. And identifying these things can help us walk back some of the resulting errors, in the least to be aware of them. Okay, so with that in mind, let's have a closer look and begin by exploring this family tree. What you see here resembles a family tree. It is a simplified family tree of major English Bible versions, if you will. One of the earliest major attempts to translate the Bible into English was conducted by a Catholic priest named John Wycliffe. He relied entirely on the Latin Vulgate, so the version that the Roman Catholic Church used for centuries. Scriptures of the church of his day were in Latin, and so he and several of his colleagues began the translation work in the 1370s. Wycliffe died before the translation was completed, but some of his co-workers finished it for him around 1390. But one thing to keep in mind with the Wycliffe version was that it was translated into something called Middle English, not Modern English, so an older version of the language. The first Bible to be translated into Modern English was translated by William Tyndale in 1526. He used the Vulgate as well as a bit of the original Hebrew and Greek to do so. 
Now, Tyndale was one of the earliest leaders of the European Protestant Reformation. And this is important because his Protestant views came through in his interpretation work, which actually led to his execution for heresy in 1536. Just a few years after Tyndale's death, King Henry VIII of England authorized the Great Bible, which was based mostly on the Tyndale version. Henry's move was connected with the founding of a new English national church called the Church of England, motivated by the fact that he wished to marry a young woman and divorce his current wife, divorce something which was not permitted by the present Catholic Church. But that's a whole other story. The Great Bible was the first English Bible to be used in church services in the Church of England. However, it was still too expensive for the average person to own a book as large as the Bible. That all changed with the publication of the Geneva Bible in 1560. This Bible was very different for several reasons. First of all, its New Testament was based on the Textus Receptus rather than on the Vulgate. The Textus Receptus was a Greek New Testament created a few decades earlier by the Dutch philosopher Erasmus, using all the best Byzantine manuscripts available to him. Secondly, the Geneva version was created by Calvinists and therefore heavily Protestant. Thirdly, it was the first English Bible to use the chapter and verse divisions that we still use today. And fourth, it was mass-produced, making it the first Bible to end up in the hands of the average English-speaking person. However, the Anglican bishops, bishops of the Church of England, were not happy with the Geneva version. They were worried it might undermine their authority. And so in response, they produced the Bishop's Bible just a few years later. The Bishop's Bible was authorized by Queen Elizabeth I. And let's take notice of this. England ended up in the situation where the Bishop's Bible was the only version being read from the pulpit, the only one people would hear in church. Meanwhile, the Geneva Bible was the only one read in the pews, so to speak read widely by everyday people. I think so far we can already begin to see the power games of monarchs. The clergy's scramble for power and control are fueling the translation of some of these versions. And it is here that King James enters the story. After Elizabeth I died, King James takes the throne. James rules England from 1603 to 1623. And he, much like the Anglican bishops, is deeply bothered by the Geneva Bible. As we mentioned, the Geneva version was the most used translation by common folk at the time. But what the king reads in this version frightens him. He is quoted as saying it contained seditious, dangerous and traitorous messaging. In addition to the interpretational decisions made by its translators, the Geneva Bible had marginal notes, a bit like Bible study notes or a Bible commentary. These notes were printed in the margins of the Geneva Bible, and King James said that these notes endorsed the right to disobey a tyrant. This is not surprising since this translation grew out of the European Reformation movement, which did disobey or rebel against the tyranny of Rome and the Pope. And as an English monarch, King James didn't like that. He didn't want his subjects to get into their heads that they could just rise up against him or think that it was biblical to resist tyrannical or immoral power. Thus, King James wants a new version to be made, one that more suits his political leanings. And so he hires Bible translators to create a new Bible translation. Now, these men he hires are not free to go where the text may take them. They are instructed by their king, 
And as they sit there translating, they know very well that James doesn't want people coming to the conclusion that they can have a justified reason to stand against the king or other sovereigns. So what do we imagine happened? What happens when a king, who can easily behead you, is looking over your shoulder as you're translating? Well, this monarchical power affects the translation work. Heavily affects it. Perhaps a better word here would be infects it. And it leads to numerous massive problems with this version. First of all, the King James Version is rife with translation errors. It is mediocre at best and is decidedly sloppy. Secondly, the presence of the British monarch is oppressively present at times. In none other, for example, than the renaming of a Bible character and a biblical book. The book of James was renamed so to honour King James. The name James doesn't exist in Hebrew. It was originally the book of Jacob. Jacob was the name of the author and the brother of Jesus. So there's a real actual changing of the text as tribute to King James. Here we can see an early publication of the KJV. Notice in the opening introduction. Diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special command. Appointed to be read in churches. To the Most High and Mighty Prince James, by the grace of God, King of Britain, France and Ireland, Defender of the Faith. Imagine having a Bible where one nation's, one nation's mortal king is called the Most High and Mighty Prince and the Defender of the Faith. Great and manifold with the blessings, most dread sovereign, which Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, bestowed upon us, the people of England. When first he sent his majesty's royal person to rule and reign over us. As stated, the presence of monarchical absolutism. Thirdly, Translations of certain texts are swayed by King James's personal prejudices and the commonly held ideas of the time. Hatred of homosexuals, women seen as second-class citizens, white supremacy, racism, pro-slavery, pro-monarchy, superstition, and classism. Let's take a look at a couple of seemingly small examples of affected translations and their massive repercussions leading up till this very day. The first example is found in Matthew 5.39, which we may best know as the turn the other cheek verse. Jesus says to his followers, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's the NIV translation. The KJV reads, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. King James wanted the public to be made to believe that there are two alternatives, and only two, when facing oppression and evil treatment, fight or flight. His stance was that Jesus wanted his followers to not resist, to not fight. Taking this argument, Jesus appears to be authorizing monarchical absolutism, saying submission is the will of God, don't fight, only flee, only surrender. And most modern translators, even until today, have meekly followed in that path of translation and interpretation of Matthew 5.39. This idea of do not resist an evil person. But let's have a look at the original language. The verse before verse 39. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. The Greek word translated to English as resist is antistenai. Antistenai literally means to stand, stenai, against, anti. 
But what translators often overlooked is that antistenai is most often used in the Greek version of the Old Testament as a technical term for warfare. It is a military term. It describes the way opposing armies would march towards each other until their ranks met. Then they would antistenai, take a stand, that is, fight each other on a battlefield, using swords and weapons and physically killing each other. And so, in short, Jesus is not saying, be a doormat, lay down meekly and just take it. Do not resist, do not defy or refuse evil. He is saying specifically, do not resist violently. Jesus is not commanding his followers to submit to evil, as tyrants and the misinformed have claimed throughout history. He is doing something far more radical, presenting a third choice that isn't passive complacency and that isn't violent, to find a way to resist without violence. Jesus was saying, do not let the opponent dictate the methods of your opposition and do not become like your enemies. Now, let us take a moment to imagine the repercussions of actually understanding this verse properly. How many downtrodden, mistreated, abused people of faith have either read this command by Jesus or been told it by a clergy and have thus concluded that it is their Lord's will for them to suffer in silence, to just accept the inhumane treatment they are receiving. How many of society's poor believe that it was God's will for peasants to be subservient to the aristocratic class? How many minorities were indoctrinated with the idea that God would not support their liberation because the amount of melanin in their skin somehow meant that they were born to be beneath, under, and they just need to suffer righteously and take it? How many battered wives have sat in their pastor's office and been read this verse, been told to forgive their husband, to turn the other cheek, and to open themselves up for further abuse. This is a prime example of how the Bible can be weaponized in the hands of the oppressor, as King James did, and many others have since. Our second example can be found in Songs of Solomon. The Book of Songs of Solomon begins on a celebratory note the King Solomon expressing his adoration for his female romantic partner. The song's primary female figure then responds to the king, and she describes herself like this in Hebrew. Now, the KJV translates this as, I am black, but comely, comely meaning beautiful. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar are the curtains of Solomon. Now, this here is an utter failure in translating the text correctly. This translation is, in fact, grammatically impossible. This conjunction at the start of this word means and, not but. Wilda Gaffney, a Hebrew biblical scholar, describes this process. The people translating that passage could not see blackness as beautiful. And so their whole identity as self-identified white men went into that one conjunction saying, in spite of being black, she's all right. But that is not what the text said. And so that was the first place where I understood that people make choices when they translate the Bible. And those choices affect what we hear from the text. Solomon 1.5 should read, I am black and beautiful. That one single translation choice of inserting the word but where and existed. I wonder how many young black girls and women in the West read that text through the years. What that translation communicated to them 
the same thing that their society around them was communicating to them, except this time, this time it had the authority of God and the wisest man on earth slapped on it, giving it a seemingly unshakable authority. And how on earth has such an erroneous and damaging mistranslation been allowed to stand till today? This is a prime example of anti-blackness and racism and white supremacy, which has colored the translation in the King James Version. And today, 18 out of 26 most used English Bible versions write the word but or yet instead of and. Only eight versions correctly translate the text. Consequently, an arresting 69% gives readers a wrong translation that perpetuates an anti-black idea about beauty that the original Hebrew rejects. In the original Hebrew, the wisest man of his time, the powerful, wealthy, God-ordained king, son of King David, is completely smitten by the beauty of this black woman who inspires in him songs and poetry, meaning also that based on this verse alone, there is a strong presence of individuals the West would today categorize as black people in the Bible, in the royal line of David, black people among Jesus' forefathers and mothers. And all of that didn't fit into King James's world or in fact the minds of many readers even today. And yet, and yet, the KJV Bible remains one of the most popular, most sold English Bible versions today. We could frankly have an entire course on the culture that surrounds the King James and why it is so problematic and harmful, and yet so difficult to separate people from this version. There is a cultish loyalty and following to this version, a blind belief that it is somehow more true or holier or closer to some other purer time, when the truth is it's being sentimental and romanticizing a truly horrible history. The KJV is one of the poorest English Bible translations, and as we've seen, is deeply steeped in British monarchical ideology, imperial white supremacy, colonialism, bigotry, and sexism. Before we move on with our Bible family tree, I'd like to point out a version which was made around the same time as the KJV, the Dewey Reams Bible. The Dewey Reams was produced by the Catholic Church at the time and was based on the Vulgate. All right, let's now move on past the King James. The first and only authorized revision of the King James Version is called the English Revised Version. It came out in the UK in 1885 and was quickly followed up by the related American Standard Version in 1901. These revised versions differed from the King James Version in a significant way. Namely, that in the years leading up to their production, many new manuscripts were found. This allowed scholars to create what is called a critical version of the Greek New Testament. This critical version combined all of the manuscripts together when working on the translation, but in particular relied heavily on the Alexandrian text, referring to the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, representing the oldest and the most accurate tradition. So the revised version, and everything that comes after it, uses this new critical text instead of textus receptus. Nowadays, the critical text is available in this book called the Nessel Eiland Novum Testamentum Graecae. If you ever study Koine Greek to read the New Testament in Greek, this is likely the text you'll be using. So, after the American Revised Version, our tree splits into a few different directions. We get the RSV, the NASB, and the Living Bible. These three were based directly on the American Standard Version. 
The RSB was interesting in that it was the first version produced by scholars from different Christian denominations, which hadn't really been done before. They were Protestants, Catholics, Greek Orthodox, and even a Jewish rabbi. It was also the first English version to get rid of the these and thous. Now, the RSV had a bit of controversy surrounding it because of its translation choice of Isaiah 7.14. In the previous version, this verse read, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, the Hebrew word for virgin is Alma, which actually just means young woman. So the RSV changed this verse to the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son. Christians understand this verse as being a direct reference to Jesus and his being born to a virgin woman, an immaculate conception. So the change, although arguably more accurate, made some people very unhappy. This, in part, led to the creation of the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. This version stands out because it is, by many, considered to be the most literal English translation of the Bible. A literal translation means a word-for-word -word translation with just a little bit of rearranging here and there to make the text readable. Now, the Living Bible is the complete opposite. It's not a translation at all. It's a paraphrase done by one man Kenneth Taylor. The upside of this version was that it made the Bible super easy to read, and therefore many people really liked it. But for now, let's return to the RSV. The Revised Standard Version was replaced in 1989 by the New Revised Standard Version. Both of these were published by the National Council of Churches, which is an umbrella organization which represents most of the mainline denominations in the United States. What do we mean by mainline? These days, most church denominations can be divided into two main categories, mainline and evangelical. Mainly, mainline churches are the more liberal ones, like the Methodists or Episcopalians while the evangelical churches are more conservative, such as the Baptists or Pentecostals. Now, the RSV is today the version most preferred by academics, as well as mainline Christians. An interesting thing to note here is that the big difference between the NRSV and the RSV is that the NRSV is gender neutral in much of its translation. So, for example, in Matthew 19.23, the RSV reads, It will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, while the NRSV says it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. The NRSV recently had an updated version released, called the NRSV UE, so Updated Edition. Okay, let's now switch over to some of the versions preferred by evangelical Christians. The three most popular are the NIV, the ESV, and the NLT. Since its publication in 1978, the NIV, or the New International Version, has remained in the top spot of the best-selling Bible in the U.S. Now, unlike many of the versions we've looked at so far, the NIV translators started from scratch. So they didn't rely on previous translations. They also used a translation philosophy known as dynamic equivalence, meaning that instead of going word for word, they went phrase by phrase. They did this in an effort to create a more readable translation, looking at the meaning of a sentence instead of just literally translating every word every time. This same philosophy was used in the NLT, or the New Living Translation, which came out in 1996. But in the case of the NLT, the translators used the work of Kenneth Taylor's Bible as a starting point and tried to retain his general style. The ESV, however, is very different. It's much more literal and is based off the old RSV. Basically, it's a conservative alternative to the more liberal NRSV. Worth noting is also the JPS Tanakh, the Jewish Publication Society version. This version only includes the Old Testament, 
Interestingly, the original JPS from 1917 was based on the American Standard Version, which is a Christian translation. However, the new JPS from 1985 is not based on any previous work. Then there is the new King James Version. Unlike all the other new translations, it is not based on the critical text. Like the old King James, it is based on the Textus Receptus. Now, over here, we have some Catholic Bible versions emerging. The NAB, New American Bible, which is the only version authorized by the Catholic Church to be read in open mass in the U.S. This version was updated in 2011 as the NABRE. This one has yet to be authorized for use in Mass. And then finally, there's the Holman Christian Standard Bible, now updated into the Christian Standard Bible, or CSB, a version popular among American Southern Baptists. Now, this Bible family tree is simplified. There are many more versions. We've looked at a few major mainstream ones with the purpose of trying to get an overview of how they came to be, the history, the reason that prompts new versions, and to get some sense of what translation methodology people are using. You can download this chart for free if you like. There's a link for you in the resources list. And there's also a link to a video that visually goes through this chart if you'd like to go through it again. Now, you might be staring at this tree and wondering, well, what's the best version? Which one do I make use of? Which one should I choose? The simple answer to that comes in three parts. Number one, there is no perfect version. Secondly, even though there is no perfect version, all English Bible versions are not equally good. We've already identified in the King James and several others that some are peppered with political agenda, some are decidedly biased in favor of one view or another, some are far more faithful to a responsible method than others, and some are more thoughtful in their interpretation of the original Hebrew and Greek. And so it's worth keeping that in mind as you choose which version to study. And thirdly, it's always best to do two things. One, to consult more than one version, be informed about the versions that you use and consult more than one, and two, it is always best to look at the original language, to consult the Hebrew and Greek texts. Coming up later in this course, we will be learning how to do that without necessarily having to actually learn ancient Hebrew and Koine Greek. Please do so if you wish to, but that task may be a bit out of reach for some, and there are very practical, easy ways to work around that. In this class, and at Zeteo School, we do recommend a version, and that version is the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, which we recommend for study. There's a reason why academics and scholars most often prefer this version. It is a pretty good translation that breaks from a lot of other translations that don't challenge or dare to revisit certain traditional translation choices. Earning an honourable mention, the NIV has its merits, and it's a pretty good version to read for personal use. It's easy to read and digest. We can also recommend a version that we haven't looked at in this family tree, called the Complete Jewish Version by David Stern, called the CJB. One of the reasons the CJB is so good is that it is translated by a Messianic Jew, and doesn't adopt the long history of overtly or covertly trying to erase the Jewishness of the story and the text. We identified earlier how there is a lot of that in Christian history. In the CJB, for example, you read the original Jewish names. Jesus is written as Yeshua, and so on. And this can lend quite an insightful and beautiful tone to the text as you're reading it. 
So all these are widely available. We will be using them in our class as we move forward. You can find them in the versions list on the BibleGateway.com list and other similar sites. Here is the summary and concluding thoughts I'd like to leave us with today. Translation is subject to interpretation. That can leave us wondering, well, does that mean that all versions are equally subjective or equally accurate? Does that mean that all translations are equally good? No, it doesn't. The history of how we got the Bible as we know it today is remarkable in that a document passing through so many hands and thousands of years of history could be proved to have such high fidelity to the original. It is a significantly well-preserved compilation of scrolls and documents. Having knowledge of the history of the canonization of the various books, the historical influences which affected translators, and the preservation of these scrolls doesn't lead to a loss of confidence as to the accuracy of the text. Rather, it makes us more informed and allows us to be more deliberate about the use of the Bible. When we understand the history of this book, we can better understand how to use it, study and consume it responsibly. It quite elegantly helps us combat both arrogance about the infallibility of translators and doubts about the accuracy of manuscripts. So, that was our class for today. Next time, we dive into exegesis, the exegetical method of contextual reading. We'll learn about what that means and how to do it tomorrow. See you then.